Hello, everyone, and welcome to this conference hosted by MS Focus, the Multiple Sclerosis Foundation. I'm your host, Deborah Foreman, the Educational Programs Coordinator for MS Focus, and I'm joined by Dr. Megan Weigel, who will be discussing how to change your life for the better with MS. After her presentation, we'll open it up for questions and comments. Now I'm delighted to introduce our speaker. Megan Weigel, DNP, is a nurse practitioner specializing in neurological care in Jacksonville Beach, Florida where she brings a unique integrative medicine and holistic nursing perspective to her practice, First Coast Integrative Medicine. She has been a multiple sclerosis certified nurse since 2005 and a nurse practitioner for over 20 years. She is also a board certified advanced practice holistic nurse. She completed a fellowship in integrative medicine at the University of Arizona in the fall of 2018 which complements her practice focus on wellness and holistic care. She is the co-founder of OMS Yoga, a nonprofit organization that brings free yoga classes to people living with MS all over the world. She is a yogi, a surfer, runner, avid reader, and the author of Monday Mantras with Megan, Weekly Intentions for Enjoying Your Journey. She enjoys her work immensely, especially educating people living with neurological issues and peers about the importance of wellness as an integral part of treatment. We're very pleased to have her join us today to present this important topic. And Megan, thank you so much for being with us. And I'm going to leave it up to you now. Thank you, Deb. Thanks, Casey. It's good to be here with everyone. Um, my cat is with me. You might <laughs> you see something float in front of the screen. Um, I'm, I'm just really excited to be here tonight and give you guys perhaps a different spin on lifestyle changes uh, and how to get motivated to implement some of them in your life um, and, and not feel so much like they're prescribed, but rather that they're something that you choose uh, to live a more fulfilling life. I'm also happy to let you know that Zoom can put lipstick on you. You don't even have to touch your face. So that's pretty fun. <laughs> so what are we going to do tonight? Uh, well, we're going to review the basics of MS really quickly because you guys, most of you, I'm sure, know these very well. I'm going to talk about the relationship between MS and vascular conditions, introduce to you some lifestyle changes as well as their benefits in MS, and help you choose to create healthy habits that make you feel good. So more than a million people in this country have MS. Three to four women to every one man has MS. It's more common in people of Northern European descent and usually more severe in Blacks and men. The most common type is relapsing MS and treatments include disease modifying therapies, symptom management and relapse management. There's a much higher incidence of MS in people with uh, low vitamin D, people who have a history of obesity in adolescence, particularly females, smoking, and, and people who have a history of clinical mononucleosis. In fact, a paper was just published um, with a report that the National MS Society pre uh, presented, I, I believe it was two weeks ago, just uh, re-edifying um, the relationship between the Epstein-Barr virus and MS, and specifically um, how, how the history of MS follows um, the diagnosis of clinical mononucleosis with a much larger group of people than was previously studied. Worse MS is associated with people who smoke and also with people who have vascular conditions. And vascular conditions are things like overweight and obesity, diabetes, high cholesterol, hypertension, um, uh, coronary artery and peripher peripheral vascular disease, and stroke. Lifestyle changes improve sense of wellness, fatigue, pain, anxiety, and vascular risk in people living with MS. So what's the deal with MS and vascular conditions specifically? Well, as I mentioned just a minute ago, they can worsen the course of MS. So one vascular comorbidity occurring at any time in the disease course results in a progression of EDSS of six by approximately six years sooner. So this is walking with an assistive device all the time, uh, six years sooner than you otherwise would be. It also results um, 
in shorter telomere length. Now you might say, what's telomere? What are telomeres? That sounds like little alien things. Well, telomeres are actually the length of a part of your chromosome and they're associated with your biological and your chronological age. Shorter telomere length has been associated with progressive MS and also with vascular conditions. So for example, you can have a chronological age of say 54 and a biological age of maybe 44, depending on how well you've lived your life, or 74 if it's been a rough one. Um, and these are uh, things that you can modify with lifestyle changes and also hopefully modify MS progression. There is much more data for the use of lifestyle changes in vascular comorbidities than in MS. And since we now know the relationship between the two, we can say that, uh, or we can assume uh, that these changes by improving your vascular health may also improve the course of your MS. We are just in the infancy of beginning to understand uh, whether or not these types of lifestyle changes can actually modify the course of disease. And that's why we rely so heavily on disease modifying therapies. Education about these things can improve your state of health and wellness. So what's a lifestyle change? Well, it's a process. It's not easy. It takes time and it takes support. It's something that you do maybe because you found your why. And by that, I mean, you found an underlying motivating factor that keeps you going, keeps you pushes, pushing through the hard days, you know, keeps you swimming upstream, so to speak. It's something that sounds worse than taking another prescription. And I put that little emoji there because if you're, for many people, um, let's say diagnosed with high cholesterol, it might seem easier to just take a Torvastatin which is a generic Lipitor, uh, than it does to um, radically change your diet if you're eating a standard American diet. So a lifestyle change, because it requires work, it's harder than putting a pill in your mouth, might, might sound like it's not so fun. It's also a change for which SMART goals can be helpful. And for those of you who are around these webinars uh, often enough, you might know that a SMART goal is something that's specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time bound. So a SMART goal, say for changing a nutrition habit might be, I am not going to drink soda and see how much weight I lose in a month. It's specific you're gonna stop drinking soda. You're gonna measure it by seeing how much weight you lose in a month. Do you think you can do it? Yeah, you really do. Is it relevant? It sure is because you drink regular soda, which is very high in sugar and calories, and maybe your blood sugar is starting to creep up. And is it time bound? Yep, you're gonna do it for a month and see how you feel. So that's an example of a SMART goal. What are the benefits of lifestyle changes? Well, depending on the change, you may have an improvement in your overall health, in your sense of well being, in fatigue, in your pain, in your weight, a difference in your sleep, uh, an improvement in cognitive issues, in mood. And in MS, we know that certain lifestyle changes, particularly, um, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, a healthy Mediterranean type diet that's followed closely results in increased cortical thickness, with, which is essentially a heart, higher brain volume. Uh, and when we're talking about uh, stress reduction, this can result in reduced relapse rates. So what's the downside? Why wouldn't you want to do this? It's hard. <laughs> it is hard to change. We were just talking before the webinar um, about the difficulties associated with weight loss, for example, because of our ideas around, uh, quote, dieting, uh, the many, many different choices that there are. And also, um, for example, in my life, my life has become much busier in the past year. And I've had to tremendously cut back on the time I spend exercising and that's starting to show up in my clothes. <laughs> so, um, but I'm tired and I don't have much time. So it's hard to change. So you have to find your why. 
how do you do that? So I'm going to give you guys a couple of uh, moments here because I know that this is recorded and you can go back to it, but I'd love for you to either open your phone and get out the notes app um, or get a piece of paper and a pen and just kind of jot some of these things down right as they come to your mind. They shouldn't be things that you really have to think about. What makes you happy? First, one or two things that come to your mind, write them down or type them in your notes. What makes you happy? What makes you feel worthwhile? What makes you feel like you're a helper? What makes you feel like people need you? What is it that you do that you bring to the table that people recognize you for? What makes you feel worthwhile? One or two things, quickly write them down. What motivates you? Who motivates you? You might be motivated by achieving goals. You might be motivated by money or by a reward when you do something good for yourself. You might be motivated by a child or a grandchild. You might be motivated by a promotion at work. Write down the first one or two things that you can think of. And then if you're still kind of stuck with all of these questions, and these are some things to help you, who makes you want to be a better version of yourself? Who makes you want to succeed? Who makes you smile? And who makes you feel loved? I'll give you guys a couple of uh, moments to write some of these things down. Who makes you want to be a better version of yourself? Who makes you want to succeed? And who makes you smile or feel loved? My hope is that as these things come to your mind, as you're writing them down, that you can actually feel in your body those feelings of your why. It's kind of like, I don't know, it's almost like an inner hug. These are my whys. So if you're still having trouble, I'll share with you mine. My whys are my family. So we have my little boy, my husband, my best friends in the whole wide world are up there in the right-hand corner, minus a couple. Uh, my whys are the feeling I get when I teach and do yoga with people, uh, when I share that experience with other people. And that's um, in the top left-hand corner, that's Mindy Eisenberg and I from Yoga Moves at uh, Consortium of MS Centers this year teaching a class. My other whys have to do with nature, my favorite places, being outside, knowing the healing benefits that nature brings for me. My work is actually a why, it's a purpose for me. So that's me um, speaking, doing something like this. This is a why for me. And then this is the um, Monday Mantras with Megan logo, writing and sharing um, from my heart is actually, that's my heart's purpose. Um, so these are my whys, if that helps you at all. How do I use these? Why do I use these? Well, I have to find a place to start. And if I can say to myself, let's say, my son and my husband are my whys, and I'm a better mom and wife if I get up and exercise every day, then I'm more likely to do it than just doing it to check it off my list. So there's a good example. Where do you wanna start? Well, I'm gonna drive you through mind, body, and spirit and give you some examples. What exactly is the mind? Well, the mind, um, is it's a, a loaded word. And as I note here, this is not a psychology course, but typically the mind is described as the thinking, feeling part of you. So it's the part of your brain that uh, we call it the monkey mind. You might get hung up on um, a specific worry or have an emotion about a specific experience. And so your mind can work for you or against you. And I'd ask you, does yours work for you or against you? Are you a glass half full person or a glass half empty? Do you ever, do you have a sense of why? And there, there are plenty of glass half empty people that would be typically considered pessimists who are just that way because they are realists. I consider myself that way. I tend to be um, 
more of a glass half empty person, but coming from, I just don't want to get disappointed and I want to be prepared, not because I feel like I'm a negative person. Where do your thoughts go when you get anxious? Are you able to say, okay, I'm a solution maker. If this happens, I'm going to do X, Y, and Z. Or if you get anxious, are you like, oh no, this is over. It's never going to get better. The bad things are all going to happen. So this is just, these are just questions for you to help understand if your mind works for or against you. Another question that I like to ask people is, um, are you always running from the tiger? Are you ready for him to get you or are you friends with him? I'll move on to the next slide because it might help, help you understand a little better. I know this picture is blurry. I have an almost five-year-old and we watch this movie, The Croods, all the time. And the dad who's in the center says to his daughter who has red hair at the bottom, her name is Eep. He says, fear keeps us alive, Eep. Never not be afraid. That's our animal brain. That's the brain we were made to have so that we could survive. It's also the brain that does not work for us. So I'd like to talk a little bit about how your mind can work for you or against you with this slide. This is really, really busy. I'm sure some of you are totally into this stuff, but I wanna make it simple. There's a theory called polyvagal theory. It has not been proven if you ask you know, an, a practicing allopathic person. Um, uh, but for someone like me who practices from an integrative standpoint, uh, what polyvagal theory is, um, is, is explaining the relationship between the parasympathetic and the sympathetic nervous system, uh, which basically involves functions that the vagus nerve uh, takes care of. They're autonomic, which means they're automatic, um, although we certainly can have feelings to make them happen. And we can go from green to red really quickly as our arousal increases. So when you're in the green zone, you have a sense of calmness, you feel connected, you're settled, you're grounded, you're curious, open, compassionate in the moment. And usually when you're in the green zone, things in your body are working well, you're digesting well, your um, immune system is working well to keep illnesses away from you. You're sleeping great. You feel healthy and vital. Um, you make good social bonds. You relate well to other people. Um, your breath is, is flowing. You're not holding your breath. Um, and, and you're just uh, connected. Your defense responses decrease. So in this green zone, you and the tiger, your buddies, you're like, hey, man, what do you have to teach me? So then we get into the yellow zone. The yellow zone is fight or flight. This is like you hear the fire alarm, man, your heart starts racing, you're out the door. Uh, you might feel panic, fear, rage, irritation, frustration. It's a state of hyper arousal. And when this happens, this is our survival mode. So if you really are, if, if your house is really on fire and you have to leave, then this increase in heart rate, shunting of the blood to your vital organs, increase in blood pressure, dilation of your eyes, all of this stuff is going to help you get out of the house really quickly and get out safely. But if we stay here for a really long time in this sympathetic hyperarousal state of danger, basically running from the tiger, what happens when our blood pressure stays up, when our heart, rest, heart rate stays up, when our um, defense responses are always on the alert? Well, we get fuel storage, which means weight gain. We get insulin sensitive, a decreased insulin sensitivity. Our digestion gets impaired because blood's being shunted to our more vital organs, like our hearts, our brains. Uh, we have a decreased immune response, so decreased ability to fight infection. We're not really relating well to other people. You still feel like you, you are able to get away. I can. I can do it. I can get away. I can get through this. But what happens when you stay here too long, uh, this, is, this is where we go up into the red zone, and we start to have this hypo arousal. So this is where you lay down and you're just like, tiger, please get me. I can't do it anymore. 
Um, you see this with burnout from careers. You see this with people who are in um, uh, negative or abusive relationships or jobs that just really beat them down. You see this after prolonged illnesses where there's no help. Um, you get a sense of disassociation, depression, helplessness, hopelessness. You feel trapped. Um, and your body is preparing for death. Now that is uh, quite an exaggeration. But if you think of it as back in caveman times, if you go from I can to I can't, you're lying down and the tiger's gonna get you. Um, so this is where we get uh, significant changes in immune response. Um, we start to lose muscle tone, our body temperature and our blood pressure at baseline may be lower than usual. Um, these uh, elevated endorphins can cause uh, low cortisol. So all kinds of things happen to the body. So as Kermit said, it's not easy being green, right? It's not easy to stay in that copacetic zone all the time, but we're trainable people. We can get ourselves out of that animal brain of always having to be afraid by doing the following things. So breath work is one. We're gonna take a deep breath now. So I want everybody to just breathe in and out. And um, if your feet aren't touching the floor or touching pedals, get them to the floor or pedals. And just press your feet into the floor. And I want you to close your eyes and take a long, slow, deep breath in through your nose. Two, three, four, five. And now open your mouth and just sigh. Two, three, four, five. Let's do it again. Breathe in through your nose. Two, three, four, five. And open your mouth and sigh. You can even ha. Two, three, four, five. Boom, you're in the green. So if you find yourself up in the yellow or the red, just take two deep breaths. You'll come back down towards the green. Meditation also keeps you in the green. Mindfulness, just this state of being here now, literally. Like I'm here right now with you guys. I know my family's in the other room. I know they're watching TV. I know that day needs a bath. I know that the dishes need to be done, but I'm actually out of those experiences and only in this one. It's the only thing I can control right now. Mindful movement is another way to improve the health of your mind. And mindful movement are things like yoga, tai chi, and qigong. Um, even walking meditation is mindful movement. Planning helps your mind. So who are the people in your neighborhood? Who can you call on when you're having a bad MS day and you need some help? Um, do you have a plan for that? Do you have a person who um, can go to the grocery store for you? Or do you use Shipt or um, I can't remember the names of the other things, but, you know, do you have um, secondary processes in place for when you need help? Do you know how to say no? Can you eliminate stressors? Take a look at your commitments. Which ones don't fulfill you? Which ones feel like things that you have to do? versus things that you need or want to do. How about people? Anybody need to clean out their friend list? It's really a lot easier to do as an adult than it was as a teenager many times, especially because we're, we're not able to be together like we used to be. And also time suckers like negative news, social media before bed, all of these things are stressors that you can get rid of. And then positive affirmations. Um, so picking a mantra, putting it on a post-it note, sticking it on your bathroom mirror, on your computer, on your car. Uh, it's one of the things I tell people to do with Monday mantras. Another thing that you can do to keep your mind clear is to just make sure that your MS is under your control. And by that, I mean, when are your appointments? When's your next MRI due? Are you having any new symptoms? Have you noticed any changes? Do you need to talk to your doctor? How often do you do your body check and your gut check with your MS? Is your disease modifying therapy working for you 
as a person and for, for your MS physically? Are your medications for symptom management working for you? Do you need a rehab tune-up like PT, OT, speech, cognitive behavioral therapy? Do you need any specialty referrals? Are your other medical conditions taken care of? Do you have refills on your medications? Simple things like this, uh, if you make into a pattern, can help take stress off your mind. So what healthy mind habit can you adopt? I'm just gonna go back to this slide for a couple of moments, let you guys take a look at it and pick a healthy mind habit. You may already be doing many of these. Let's move on to body. What can you control about your body? Well, you can control how you nourish it. You control, can control how you move it and you can control how you rest it. And that's even in the setting of insomnia. So I'm not gonna harp on diet too much. If you guys hear me speak, you hear me say this, eat food, not too much, mostly plants. The right diet for you is the one that you will follow. There are a tremendous amount of uh, diets that are quote for MS. And I encourage people to take a look at these. And if you need a plan, choose the one that works best for you. And if not, err on the side of eat food, not too much, mostly plants. So. Most of your plate is filled with things that grow from the ground. Drink plenty of water each day and take a look at your daily intake. So from a standpoint of nourishing your body, what can you take out? Simple as that. Can you take out soda, alcohol, sweet tea, processed snacks or desserts? What can you put in? Could you put in a handful of greens with each meal? That's so simple. Could you add chia or flax seeds to oatmeal in the morning or for lunch? Very simple. One thing you can take out, one thing you can put in. Moving your body. Well, some of you might not be able to move your bodies in the same way that you used to be able to, and that might really stink. And I'm not going to, um, I'm not gonna deny you that uh, grief and anger um, about those things but it's really important to choose activities that make you happy and involve moving your body. And if there's something that you love to do that you struggle to do now, whether it be because of fatigue or because of mobility or because of heat sensitivity, seek out adaptive exercise. So depending on the cities that you're in, you actually may have a rehabilitation hospital that does adaptive sports. Here in Jacksonville, we have a great adaptive sports program through Brooks Rehab. Um, you can seek out a personal trainer or an exercise specialist who is well-versed in, um, in adaptations and modifications to help you move in the way that you like to move. You can also move to music. Exercising at your best time of day is really helpful and doing something is better than nothing. So I used to have ridiculous ideas about exercise for myself. And now I think, well, if I can just get 15 to 20 minutes of movement in today, it's better than not doing anything at all. And that movement might be stretching. It might be doing, um, some yoga, it might be teaching yoga to you guys one Monday a month, you know, it, it could be anything, but it's moving my body and it's keeping, keeping my blood flowing. Resting your body. Many people have trouble sleeping more, uh, more people probably have trouble sleeping than sleep normally. Um, and so I say you can control resting your body. You might not necessarily be able to control your sleep but you can help your body rest and you can prime your body for better sleep by avoiding the use of electronics for at least an hour before bed. And if you use a handheld device, say to read or listen to music or listen to an app or a meditation or something like that, use a blue light filter on the screen or get blue light blocking glasses. They're really cheap on Amazon. They're like $10. This um, changes the light frequency that um, blue light from devices actually affects our pineal gland and the release of melatonin and it can mess with our sleep-wake cycle. 
Also avoid caffeine, excessive alcohol and sugar before bed. Although many people say, well, I have to have a drink at night to sleep well, you're actually not getting quality sleep. Alcohol dehydrates the body, raises the heart rate, can even cause arrhythmia while sleeping. And you can also consider creating a calming bedtime ritual like gratitude journaling at night, gentle stretching, using an essential oil, uh, or drinking decaf herbal tea if it's not going to keep you up all night going to the bathroom. What healthy body habit can you adopt? This might be a nutrition habit, putting something in or taking something out. It might be a movement habit, committing to five or 10 minutes of movement a day if you're not already doing so, or committing to a better rest habit. So let's move on to spirit, mind, body, spirit. So what is spirit? Spirit is often defined as an essence, a force, a connection. It's described as your soul. I like to think of it as your figurative heart, um, having uh, heart feelings, warm fuzzies, um, a sense of connection with another people, all of those things tend to come from a force you can't describe, right? So if done with the right intention, what you do to nourish your mind and your body will also nourish your spirit. And by that, I mean, you're not doing things to nourish your mind and body just to check things off. Uh, your to-do list. You're doing things to nourish your mind and body because you really want to, you really want to work for your why. What you do to nourish your spirit will nourish your mind and provide motivation to nourish your body. So things that you do to nourish your spirit, enhancing your sense of connection, taking time to spend time with that figurative heart, with your soul, helps your helps improve the, the positivity of your thinking, feeling mind, which in turn um, helps you feel more connected to your why. So what things can you do? Well, embody the positive affirmation you use. So under uh, mind suggestions, I said, write down positive affirmation. Well, you can write it down and you can read it every day, but it's not as powerful as if you wrote it down, read it and tried to feel it in your body. So an example is, um, let's see, I'm worthy. So you might just read it and say, I'm worthy, go on about your day. It's probably not gonna do much, you might do something over time. But if you say I am worthy and you sit down and you close your eyes and you take a few deep breaths while in your mind you're saying I am worthy and you feel what it feels like to deserve the things that you want to deserve good things that feeling that embodiment nurtures your spirit use mindfulness or meditation or prayer to connect to your higher power and so again you're not just sitting in meditation to do it you're sitting in meditation and you're paying attention to the sounds around you to the feelings of your body uh, to the temperature of the air. Um, and maybe there's a sense of something that is greater than you that comes to you through meditation. Other things that provide food for your soul are creative acts like coloring, painting, gardening, arranging flowers, playing with your kids or grandkids connecting with loved ones, a long hug, like hugs longer than, I think it's 30 seconds actually release oxytocin, which is the hormone that connects mothers and babies. Um, it's, it's considered the love hormone. Uh, getting outside and enjoying nature also nurtures your spirit. So what healthy spirit habit can you adopt? I'll leave these up here just for a few moments. I love the book, You Can Heal Your Life by Louise Hay. Many of you may have it. 
in the back of the book is a symptom index and you can look up things that bother you physically and um, read a positive affirmation about those things. So if you're not quite sure where to start with positive affirmations, that's a really good place. The book's called You Can Heal Your Life by Louise Hay. So healthy spirit habits, what can you adopt? Well, if you've listened to this for the past 36 minutes and you're like, I just can't, I have no idea where to start. I, you know, all of this stuff sounds like bunk to me. It sounds awful. I've been through too much. There's just no way. Um, these are people who can help you. Um, I highly recommend counseling. I also recommend life coaches or health and wellness coaches. And I recommend connecting with friends and family. Um, say, hey, this is my goal. Can you check in with me every two days or once a week and, um, and just check in and see how I'm doing to meet it? And if I've fallen off the wagon, encourage me to get back on. All of this to say that these lifestyle changes that can help you live a better life than people without MS are living result in healing. And what is healing? Well, healing is a subtle process. It's not a big wow. Sometimes it's a, it's a light bulb uh, or a light switch that gets turned on um, after a lot of work has been done and you think, gosh, maybe that's not gonna happen. Uh, but so, most of the time it's a subtle process it is something that gives you a sense of purpose and meaning. It does involve what brings you joy or satisfaction. And it doesn't involve fixing or curing something that you think is wrong with you. Rather, it's an exploration, a connection, and it's an active role that you have with, um, with a condition. A cure is a medical procedure that reliably helps you recover from illness. Healing is an inner process through which the human organism seeks its own recovery physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. Will you choose one of these changes that we talked about tonight so that you can heal? Sorry for the blurry slide here, but um, I love this. It never gets old for me. This circle down here, this is your comfort zone. This big circle out here, this is where the magic happens. So consider choosing one of these lifestyle changes from each mind, body, and spirit, making a smart goal and do it out here where the magic happens. And with that, I will turn it back over to Deb. I think I'm going to go back to one of my first slides um, where SMART goals are, are defined, just in case people want to take notes. Um, Great information, Megan. Yeah, Great and then I'll take questions. Thanks. Wonderful. OK, everybody, we're ready for questions. If you have a question or a comment, Please use the raise hand feature in the app or you can send your question via Q, the Q&A app. If you'd like, you can even send in your question anonymously if that's something you wanted to do. Um, I do have, uh, you know, a lot of things that you said resonated with me also. <laughs> and I wrote them all down because I said, I'm not going to miss these. Um, uh, you know, we talked about drinking more fluids and I was just given a gift because it's also difficult for me to know how much you're drinking and to keep up with that every day. But I'm gonna show you all. Someone just gave this to me. I don't know how blurred it is, but it's a 40 ounce container that has a handle on it. So much easier than holding a regular drinking flask or a cup. Yeah, and like this thing is yeah, easier than that, yeah. 40 ounces, it was just given to me about a month ago. And I, every single day know that I drink, yep, Casey's got it too that I'm drinking at least minimally 40 ounces. And then I'm so proud of myself each time I fill that up, like 
you know, yeah. I was never able to remember when I kept filling up glasses. So now right. that's sort of my marker as to how much I'm drinking. So it's just a great idea. And I feel better. Drinking. And you know, they, I don't know if they make one with a handle, but they do make one like this. That's really cool. It has like for every, um, uh, 10 ounces, it says like, Hey, you're doing great. Keep chugging. <laughs> oh, know, nice. Like nice, positive affirmations. Yeah. Um, very helpful. I've got a question in the Q and a, should I just go ahead with it? Uh, if I, I was going to read it to you, but if you want to do that, that's up to you. Do you want, is it easier for me just to read it? Sure. Okay. This is from, um, let's see, this was anonymous. How can I use lifestyle to help with coping with my recent diagnosis? I am recently diagnosed with RRMS. I have had trouble coping with my diagnosis and I'm fearful of my future. My neuro recommended a psychiatrist who prescribed me anti-anxiety medication only on our second meeting and lasted all of 15 minutes. It didn't feel like a good experience. Uh, so I can tell you, you are not alone in, ex in experiencing this not good experience with, uh, with psychiatry. Um, I would strongly encourage you to uh, make an appointment with a licensed mental health counselor or a psychologist for talk therapy or cognitive behavioral therapy. It's, um, it's difficult to do right now because of the pandemic, everyone needs it. And some, depending on where you are, people could be booking out six, nine months, take an appointment. Um, your insurance company might also be able to tell you of, uh, there are some virtual therapy programs where um, you meet you know, on, on Zoom. Uh, with licensed mental health counselors. Um, so I would definitely talk to a counselor. The other thing I would encourage you to do is to adopt one of these um, mindful behaviors. So something like uh, using an app once a day uh, that gives you a positive meditation. I like the apps Calm and Insight Timer because you can put in the time that you want the guided meditation to be and you can pick the topic. Um, so I, I highly recommend doing something like that. Um, and also staying in touch with uh, friends and family and talking about your, uh, your experiences, your feelings, keep coming to webinars like this, utilize this, pay, this organization, uh, MS Foundation, utilize uh, Can Do MS, the National MS Society, um, the MS Association, um, all of these opportunities that they have for people to be together and answer questions, I think is super important. Um, those, those would be my best, my best pieces of advice for you. Don't be discouraged by the psychiatrist. You just need someone who does what you need, which is a person who can talk to you. Finding the right person is so important. Yeah. Um, Robert has asked, well, he wanted you to know that he said his kids are his why. He says they are his reason to be the best me. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Yeah, it's so true. I mean, it just, when you think about the repercussions of your behavior on your kids, it tends to really help be a motivating factor uh, for behavior change. So thank you for sharing that, Robert. Um, Casey, I see uh, a question here about commenting on yoga or exercise classes mm -hmm. and how to find appropriate ones. That's a great question. Um, so many resources, you guys. So I'll start with the ones that I know the best. So my yoga program is OMS Yoga and you can find out information um, at omsyoga.org. We do virtual classes twice a week. There's also Yoga Moves MS, M-O-V-E-S, and that's yogamovesms.org. Um, they have, I think, four to five virtual yoga classes per week. Um, MS Views and News does one yoga and one Pilates class per month that you can register for on their website. Um, Dr. Gretchen Hawley has an excellent exercise program and she gives great tips 
on her Instagram and Facebook page, um, and it's Dr. Gretchen, D-R-G-R-E-T-C-H-E-N. Um, she's a, a doctor of physical therapy. Um, there's also my MS gym and MS workouts. Both of, both of these are programs that you can join online. There are various apps for exercises. Um, there is Abby, A-B-Y. Uh, there is, um, oh gosh, what's the other one I'm thinking of? I think it's just that one. And then through these patient advocate or advocacy organizations like MS Foundation, like National MS Society, MSAA, they often have print resources that you can find online and look at. Um, so I, I encourage you to take a look at some of those resources and, um, and uh, it's never, um, it's never a bad time to look at MS specific exercises. You may say, well, I don't need that right now, <laughs> you know, um, but what we're teaching are very um, in integral movements for balance and coordination that even if you um, look so good with MS are gonna make you a better 65 year old walking down a slippery floor. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. and, and if you can tell that you have MS and you have mobility challenges, then doing things according to your needs are just going to make, it's just going to help you be stronger. I agree. And people are saying thank you to you. I don't know if you see all their little I, messages. I have but... that open. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Casey, awesome. MS focus, dance classes, art, yoga, exercise. Awesome. Yep. Yep. Do. So um, and also somebody does know about, um, uh, who did we mention? Gretchen, Dr. Gretchen. Yes. Yep. So how do I differentiate between good stress and bad stress? I am newly diagnosed, still working at a stressful job. And this is a question from Val. I think that's a really great, great question, Val, because good stress can easily become bad stress. And I'll give you, a, I'll give you an example. Um, Debbie's daughter just got married. Her son's getting married. So you're planning a wedding, right? You're so excited. This is amazing. I've been waiting my whole life to get married or my whole life for my daughter or son to get married. And, you know, I just can't wait for this to happen. And I'm going to go get a new outfit. And then suddenly you're on your iPhone until 2 a.m. looking at uh, rehearsal dinner venues, picking out, you know, various things. Uh, for the wedding and that goes on for two weeks and then you're exhausted and then you get bronchitis. So I hope that's a good way to see how good stress becomes bad stress. Similarly for me, um, around the time of uh, consortium, which is in May, usually this year it was in October and now it's gonna be in May again. I very frequently have two or three talks to write. They're each about 45 minutes long. It's also the time of year where I have um, uh, education courses for some certifications that I'm doing. I'm sorry for the noise. Um, and I am so excited about all these things because they're things that I love to do. But by the time the consortium actually arrives, I'm like, oh my God, I just need a nap. So that's when good stress becomes bad stress. So you're working at a stressful job. Um, I would encourage you to um, really be intentional about taking care of yourself when you get home from your job and, um, and you know, cut out, even if it's five minutes of like, this is my space in my house where I go to have my time and fill my cup. Right. That can help with the, the bad stress of a stressful job. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Debbie did say yes, function specific, functional exercises. Functional exercises. Yep. Yep. She likes those. So everybody's saying thank you. I do have one, something that you mentioned about cleaning out your friend list. It struck yes. a chord because such a so, hard chord. Many, so many times they can bring you down. And so many of our friends especially with COVID, 
Mommy. Need us. <laughs> Can you say hi? <laughs> hi. Hi. I'll be right there. Okay? Mommy, I don't really want to eat my okay. dinner. That's fine. <laughs> Okay, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> um, I, I realized that so many people, like if, if you're looking for something to really make you feel good, then think about people that may not have MS, but people that are really not doing well, especially in the pandemic. Mm. And so many people are alone. And I found that I know several people who are alone, really alone. And because of the pandemic, they really have no one to talk to. So it's it gives me great pleasure. It makes me feel good. It makes me whole by calling them every single day to make sure that they're okay to just chat because I may be the only human that they're talking to. Yeah. So it's, it's easy and it doesn't matter how, um, it doesn't matter if our hands work. It doesn't matter if our feet work. It doesn't matter if we can't sit, we could do it in bed if we were lying in bed. And it's just one of those things that's easy. And it really brings most people great joy by helping. And it's just an idea for those that can't get out. To you know, help. that's, that's an incredible idea that I need to put under spirit that I didn't. And it's service. Right. So service really fills up our soul cup. And speaking about cleaning out your friend list, um, you may find that, I mean, I found during the pandemic that I'm now back in touch with people that I hadn't talked to in, in so long because I've made space for them instead of people who were just kind of time fillers and neither one of us were really bringing anything to the table to, to a relationship. It was just like, oh, let's have a glass of wine. Oh, yay. Who needs another one of those? I don't. So I think that's a really great idea. Instead of choosing that, just I'm going to do this because I feel like I'm going to miss out on something, choose instead to call a person who has nothing to miss out on. They don't have anything. Yeah. Hi, Jean. Hi, Myrna. Makes everybody happy. <laughs> yeah. So Mer I think her name is Myrna, but it came up as Myrn. Um, said decluttering her home, being a minimalist, less is more, gives such clarity to her. Excellent suggestion every, however often you want to do it. And in, in my house, every three months I walk around and I just throw stuff out, give it to Goodwill, try to declutter. Yeah. Great. Great also, suggestion, Marna. Um, I, if anybody wants to ask a question, just go ahead and type it into chat or you can raise your hand if you like, and I'll let you speak to Megan. Um, I had one more thing that I'd written down because you had talked about, um, again, clean, you know, cleaning out your friend list. And I love that sign that I saw somewhere saying your vibe attracts your tribe, right? <laughs> yes. It's, it's really great. And I, and I, I believe that. So let's see. Um, I love that you let your little boy to come check in with you. <laughs> it's a great way to show love and recognition to him. So, and that's what Claudia wants you to know. Thanks, Claudia. I see. This is, this is our new world, right? We're working yeah. from our homes and, and this is, I love Zoom. <laughs> I love Zoom. I tell everybody that's tired of it. I say, I love it. The beauty of you being able to have your son come in and it's all good. Like, yes. it, it is what it is. So it's <laughs> also, great. he's adorable. So that helps. <laughs> Thanks, yeah, Stacey. yeah, yeah. he's adorable. <laughs> So anyway, I don't know that we have any other questions. Um, I, we have a lot of thank yous, thank yous, thank yous, and I will agree with that. So I want to say thank you too. Let's let's tell you about what's coming up. Okay. Um, that is all the time we have for now in terms of questions. But we, I want if you missed any of this, I'd like you to know that you can go. This this conference will be replayed on msfocusradio.org eventually and available on demand on our MS Focus SoundCloud page or our YouTube page. Remember to follow MS Focus on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram for times and access information. Our next teleconference is gonna be this coming Tuesday, um, February 8th at 3.30 p.m. Eastern time. And the speaker is gonna be Dr. Ben Thrower from the Shepherd Center in Atlanta. And he's gonna be discussing the most up-to-date information on COVID-19 and MS. Our sincere thanks to all of our attendees and for your participation, Megan, I Thank you guys. Really, you're fabulous and we love you. And um, you're so kind to in your busy schedule fit us in <laughs> tonight. So it's it's on it's on my uh it's on my why my why list, uh, right? Nice. So <laughs>
Thank you. And for everybody else, good night, everyone. And we look forward to seeing you next time. Bye-bye. Be well. Good night.